Welcome back to Fictional History 101. I'm your fictional professor, Aaron Johnson. We're going to continue our lecture on Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, specifically the Grips Conflict. Our last lecture covered the escalation of the Grips Conflict, as well as the entrance of the Xeon forces from Axis into the conflict. The Titans were left in a precarious situation at the end of our last lecture, as public opinion was turning against them more sharply than ever before. While there had been a sense of discontent with the Titans, there was no real desire to be rid of them. However, after Quattro's speech at Dakar, and the images of the Titans nearly destroying the Assembly, a desire to see the Titans overthrown was beginning to coalesce. After the Battle of Dakar, the Aug forces returned to space. While the Aug regrouped, the Titans planned to counterattack. They mobilized Bascom and the Dogo Skiar, while also deploying a cyber new type to infiltrate the Aug's Argama while it was docked for resupply at side 2. At this point, the Aug had discovered rumors that Grips 2 had been converted into a giant laser system. They planned to move the Argama towards the converted colony to investigate these rumors, and prepare to take action against the Titans. The Aug conducted a reconnaissance mission against the Titans, sending their ace pilot Camille Bidon to more closely investigate the colony. However, he was intercepted by an enemy mobile suit and forced to retreat. Shortly after the failed mission, the Titans prepared to test fire the Grips 2 laser. Their target? The colonies of Side 2. With only 40% power, the laser was able to blast a 200 meter hole in two sides of Colony 18, as well as partially damaging the solar reflectors. While there are conflicting numbers, most estimates put the casualty count in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. This was meant as both a test of the capabilities of the colony laser, as well as a demonstration of power to those colonies still neutral and arrayed against the Titans. Following from this demonstration, the Titans planned to disperse G3 nerve gas into another colony within Side 2. Colony 21 would detect the Titans units escorting the gas pod and hail the Argama for assistance. The Argama moved to protect Colony 21, deploying their mobile suit forces. Unfortunately, they'd be too late. The Titans successfully deployed the G3 nerve gas. While the AU forces would drive off the Titans mobile suits, there were no survivors within the colony. With two successful operations, the Titans felt emboldened. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to stop the colony laser from destroying any target of the Titans' choosing, and gas attacks had proven to be incredibly difficult to prevent even with advanced notice. Jamatov and Basque felt that they could attack any hostile targets with impunity, and the AU found their supporters beginning to worry. The Titans arrayed their forces for another assault on side 2, hoping to keep the AU forces occupied. They prepared multiple G3 canisters, along with squadrons of mobile suits. If the AU intended to keep the supporters they had, they would need to demonstrate their ability to protect them from the Titans. All of this was simply a feint, as the Titans used this offensive as cover while they moved the colony laser closer to Granada. Their real plan? To eliminate the primary source of AU support and supplies, allowing them to more easily engage and defeat the AU. Granada heard of this possible laser attack and began to evacuate its citizens, while others sought refuge in newly constructed underground shelters. While the Dogos Gyar had planned to join this faint operation, it would be recalled to Grips 2 due to the captain of the Alexandria, Gaddy Kinsey, refusing to join the operation due to claimed engine troubles. Captain Kinsey was noted to have a number of disagreements with the heavy-handed tactics of the Titans, and would serve as an indicator of the growing fractures within the Titans. While the AU would successfully drive off the Titans' forces, they found themselves needing to counterattack immediately. If they waited, the Titans would fire the colony laser on Granada. Under orders from Anaheim Electronics, the AU moved to re-establish contact with Haman Karn, the Aug hoped to salvage the previously botched negotiations, an ally with the Axis forces. Haman agreed to reopen negotiations between Axis and the Aug, heading to the Argama in person to decide the terms of an alliance. Her terms? Recognition of the Zabi family as a ruling party. As an incentive to join, the Aug was prepared to offer side 3 to the Axis forces. Their only condition? That Axis destroy the Titan's colony laser. 
Both sides agreed to the terms, and Haman departed to prepare for the attack on the colony laser. The coordinated attack would begin shortly after, with the AU advancing on the Titans while the Axis forces held back for the assault on the colony laser. Haman sent a message to the Titans, feigning a desire to help in defending the colony laser. However, this was only a cover to get closer to the laser in preparation for their assault. Axis's Guadan battleship attacked the colony laser, destroying one of the attached thrusters and sending the laser off course from Granada. This would leave the colony laser useless for the time, as it would not be able to be aimed accurately. Haman would claim that this was simply a targeting error from her forces, and during the confusion of the surprise attack, the Ayug forces disengaged from the Titans. In the aftermath of the battle, Haman arranged to meet with Jamatov. Despite the betrayal of the Axis forces, the Titans needed to keep them on their side in order to win the war with the Ayug, and would take any opportunity to sway them back to their side. Haman would meet with Jamatov aboard the Gate of Zidane, she made the same request to the Titans as she did the Ayug, the revival of the Zavi family. However, this was a ruse in order to get close enough to Jamatov and attempt to assassinate him. She had smuggled in a cyanide capsule in one of her earrings, and although she was able to use it in the meeting chamber, Jamatov was able to escape the gas attack. Immediately after, a coordinated assault from the Ayug and Axis forces began. The Guadan engaged the Titans' forces as it fled the gate of Zidane, while the Ayug mobile suits launched their own assault to cover Haman's retreat. The Titans rallied their own forces as well, deploying their mobile suits in assembled fleet against the combined forces. Despite heavy fighting, the Ayug and Axis forces were able to withdraw. With an attempt on Jamatov's life, there would be no alliance between the forces on Axis and the Titans. To make matters worse, as the battle between the Titans' forces and the retreating Ayug and Axis began, Shiraka refused to commit his forces, citing engine trouble on the Jupitrus. This left the Titans in an extremely vulnerable situation. With few allies and facing a combined Ayug Axis force, the Titans depended on the colony laser, which was still not repaired. They also faced division from within, with both the captain of the Alexandria, one of their primary battleships, and Sharako proving to be unreliable. The Ayug and Axis forces intended to press their advantage, aiming the asteroid Axis at the gate of Zidane. Haman planned to crash the asteroid into the Titan's base, hoping to break the bulk of the Titan's forces. Although Jamatov had survived the assassination attempt, losing the forces at the gate of Zidane would be a disaster for the Titans. The Ayug forces regrouped and launched another assault, intended to keep the Titans forces trapped in the gate of Zidane while the Axis asteroid rammed it. Haman lent her own ships and mobile suits to the battle, hoping to crush the Titans in a decisive battle. The Titans could do nothing to halt the advance of the Axis asteroid, which crashed through the gate of Zidane, sending debris into the fleeing Titans forces. Many Titans ships and mobile suits were destroyed in the confusion. Both sides would disengage as the debris made the area too difficult to fight in, and the Titans had no reason to remain in the area now that the Gate of Zidane was lost. A round of negotiations followed the battle. The Ayug sent a delegation, including Quattro, to meet with Haman. In addition, Shiraco arranged to meet with Haman to negotiate separately. Jamatov insisted on joining this meeting, as he believed Shiraco might be angling to gain more power for himself. Shiraka, with a pair of his most trusted pilots, headed towards the Guadan for the meeting. Jamatov hoped for one last chance to attain an alliance between the Titans and the Axis forces. However, during the meeting, Haman showed only disdain for the Titans and their scattered forces. During the meeting, Shiraka would draw a gun, intending to kill Haman, and what followed after was chaos. Quattro burst into the meeting, gun drawn and ready to shoot Shiraco, and while he managed to graze him, one of the new type pilots Shiraco brought with him fired a beam from their mobile suit, nearly killing everyone in the meeting room. Although Shiraco, Jamatov, Quattro, and Haman would survive, they would scatter after the destruction of the room. With Jamatov and Shiraco left alone, Shiraco revealed the true target of his trap, Jamatov himself. Turning his gun on him, he killed him. 
With no witnesses, Shiraku claimed that Haman had been the one to kill Jamatov and rallied the surviving Titans forces to strike at the Axis, even destroying the Guadan during his escape. While many of the Titans would follow Shiraku, there was a faction that sided with Bascom. As Bascom was openly suspicious of Shiraku's motives from the beginning, the death of Jamatov only served to confirm his beliefs. Basque's forces were stationed aboard the Dogoski R and were equipped with the remaining Cyber New Type and mobile armor. Shiraku and his bodyguards engaged Haman in a mobile suit battle. However, she was able to fend off the three mobile suits through a combination of her new type abilities and her advanced Cubalay mobile suit. The arrival of additional mobile suits, including Quattro and the AUG ace pilot Camille Bidon, meant Shiraku would have to break off his attempt to kill Haman. While the Aegean and Titan's forces engaged one another, Haman quietly withdrew from the battlefield, moving to take control of the colony laser. Both the Aegean and Titans would head after her. By this point, there were no more deceptions between the three groups. Haman had revealed her intention to steal the colony laser for Axis, and Shiraku had taken control of the majority of the Titans. All three groups were looking to control the colony laser to defeat their enemies. The winner of the coming battle would likely control all of the Earth sphere. The AU prepared to commence Operation Maelstrom. The plan was to encircle the Grips II colony laser with their fleet and take control of the weapon. They launched squadrons of mobile suits and rallied their fleet. At the same time, the Argama's ace pilot Camille would launch ahead of the main offensive to hide near the new Axis flagship, the Guanban. The hope was to engage and possibly kill Haman Karn as she left the flagship in her mobile suit if she decided to join the battle. The Ayug started their attack by focusing on the Axis defenses around the colony laser. While many Axis forces lacked combat experience, their cutting-edge weaponry and numbers meant they would still be a danger to the Ayug fleet trying to break through. As the battle progressed, Haman would find herself needing to join the battle, as her forces were unable to keep the Ayug from breaking through. As she did so, Camille engaged her, keeping her from joining the battle and forcing her to retreat. With Haman kept out of the battle, the Aeg forces were able to take control of the colony laser and force the Axis ships to withdraw from the battle. However, the Aeg forces couldn't rest, as the asteroid Axis was on a collision course with the lunar city of Granada. The Aeg's Argama set off in pursuit, hoping to take control of the asteroid and redirect it. As the Ayug approached Axis, they would encounter Bascom's forces. Shiraku also deployed a squadron of mobile suits to finish off Basque's forces. Despite having several ace pilots and a powerful mobile suit, Bascom would perish aboard the Dogos Gyar. This would leave Shiraku as the uncontested ruler of the Titans for the time being. While the Ayug's attempt to redirect the asteroid manually wouldn't work, they were able to send a message to the colony laser. The Ayug fired the laser at Axis, using the force of the weapon to push the asteroid off course and save Granada. They would immediately return to the colony laser, as the Ayug needed all its forces to fend off the approaching Axis and Titan's forces. What followed was the most intense battle of the conflict. Axis, Ayug, and Titan's forces clashed in the area around the colony laser and even inside the colony laser itself. The Ayug suffered heavy losses early on, losing several ace pilots as well as the Radish, one of their main battleships. As the Titans faced losses of their own, Shiraku launched in his own mobile suit hoping to sway the battle. With the numbers stacked against them, the Ayug devised a plan. They hoped to lure the Titans fleet into the firing line of the colony laser and use the laser to wipe out the bulk of their forces. Haman herself brought her mobile suit into the colony laser to attempt to take control of it, while Shiraku attempted to disable it with his mobile suit to protect his fleet. All three groups grappled for control of the laser, even fighting outside of their mobile suits in places. The Ayug was able to maintain control of the laser long enough to fire it. This would lead to the destruction of the Alexandria and the majority of the Titan's fleet. With only the Jupiteris and a few remaining ships surviving, the Titans were all but destroyed. Shiraku attempted to retreat to the Jupiteris, however he was intercepted by Camille. Camille was able to crash his Zeta Gundam into Shiraku's mobile suit, crushing him inside of it. While the two battled, Quattro fought with Haman. She offered him a chance to rejoin Axis, but he rejected her, 
and even with a mobile suit with no limbs, he managed to drive her off. Quattro would not be found after the battle. Despite the AU emerging the victors from the battle, they would suffer terrible losses. Camille was left mentally crippled after killing Shirako, Quattro was missing in action, and the Ayug fleet had been decimated. While the Titans were completely defeated as a result of the battle, the Axis forces would suffer relatively little, and would be in a prime position militarily. The Ayug withdrew the Argma to side one, and prepared for what would come next. This would be the close of the Grips conflict, and would serve as the seeds for the first Neo-Zeon war, but we'll go into that in another lecture. The Grips conflict was, in many ways, a much smaller conflict than the One-Year War. The Ayug never approached the size and force of the Principality of Zeon, nor did the Titans have full use of the Earth Federation military. There were no mass deployments of nuclear weapons, and although the Titans would deploy nerve gas against several colonies, it would never reach the widespread horrors of Zeon. However, it can be argued that this conflict was just as important in shaping history in the Universal Century. The Earth Federation was substantially weakened following the end of the Grips conflict, which would allow a relatively small Xeon force from Axis to pose a major threat to the Earth sphere. Nearly every influential figure from the time would be killed or go missing after the Grips conflict as well, with the AU losing nearly all of its ace pilots, Quattro missing, and many Earth Federation aces either having been killed while serving under the Titans or disappearing entirely after the conflict. Advances in new type and cyber new type related technologies were plentiful during this time as well. New methods for creating cyber new types had been pioneered by the Titans, and the use of mobile armors by these new types was increasingly common. It served as a grim image of the future of warfare within the Universal Century. Before we go, I have a question from Alex Adam. Alex writes Why would the Titans ally with the Axis Xeon? The leaders of the Titans might not have cared so much about stopping Xeon ideology and were more concerned with power, but the pilots and soldiers who were fighting for the Titans, I think, were there to stop Xeon loyalists. Do you know why the pilots did not mass defect after knowing they would now be allies with the people their organization was created to destroy? Thanks for the question, Alex. I think this is an interesting point and one that Zeta Gundam unfortunately doesn't provide a lot of information on. I believe that the relationship between Axis and the Titans was kept relatively quiet, with only the Inner Circle privy to this information. You can see there isn't a widespread deployment of Axis forces during the Grips conflict until the very end of the conflict, limiting the amount of officers and pilots who would even be aware of this alliance. This would leave only the hardline Titans officers to deal with the issue, and they would most likely be under the thumb of Jamatov and Bascom. The other thing to note is that a lot of higher-ranking Titans officers seem to have been selected less for a dedication to wiping out Xeon and more for promoting their own power. You see this in figures like Jared Mesa who were less concerned about defeating Xeon and more interested in the rise of their personal power and standing. Some high-ranking officers such as the captain of the Alexandria, Gaddy Kinsey, were critical of the Titans' methods and likely would have objected to an alliance with the Axis. However, this is all conjecture based on relatively little information. That wraps up our lecture series on the Grips Conflict and, by extension, Zeta Gundam. The Universal Century has a lot of events ahead of us, including the first and second Neo-Zeon Wars, the Laplace Incident, and a few others we'll go into when we can. If you have any questions or comments about the lecture, please feel free to let me know at fictionalhistory101 at gmail.com. Thank you all for joining us today, and please, don't forget to study. The intro and outro music for this class is Labyrinth by Enrico Altavia, courtesy of freesoundtrackmusic.com.